Good morning, Harrow Baptist Church, and happy Father's Day to all of the fathers at Harrow Baptist. And even more so, we are grateful for all of the men that the Lord has blessed us with uh, here at here at Harrow Baptist. Uh, as we do begin, we are going to read Psalm chapter 146. Psalm 146. We'll read the whole psalm. Uh, just by way of announcement, uh, as you are turning there, uh, we are meeting in person. Uh, there is registration for each of those services, uh, so you can feel free to, uh, to hop on there and see uh, about registering for a service at 9 and 11 on Sunday mornings, uh, if you are able. If not, we are grateful that the Lord has uh, this for us to be able to, to study his word together. Uh, so I will read Psalm 146. Psalm 146 says this, Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless. But the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we are uh, so grateful for your power uh, over everything, Father. But we're also grateful for your love and your care for us as your people. We pray this morning as as we look into your word together that you would challenge us, convict us, grow us, encourage us from your word, and Lord, that all of it would go towards uh, conforming us more into the image of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the men that you have blessed us with at Harrow Baptist, and we pray, Father, that uh, the men of our church would know that they are appreciated, uh, Lord, that uh, in their service, uh, that, that they do amongst our church family, uh, that you would encourage them uh, even today. Lord, we pray that this next little while would bring glory and honor to Christ, and Lord, would serve to uh, lift up, elevate, and proclaim your name. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Marty. Good morning, everyone, and happy Father's Day. Well, gentlemen, what a privilege it is for us to lead our families as husbands and fathers. You know, as it's, a, it's an incredible privilege, but it's also a great responsibility, isn't it? And we feel that every day. It's also a serious challenge. Now, the Dad Challenge is not an obstacle course where you have to uh, change a diaper, uh, run off to work, uh, pay some bills, come home and cut the grass, help with homework, teach somebody to ride a bike, then teach them to drive a car, then give them the keys to your car, and then pay for college, and to do it all faster and better than the guy in the next house. That is not the Dad Challenge. That might be what the world's trying to get us to do. But the true dad challenge is what goes on around and underneath all of these other things that take place as we walk through life with our families. You see, we're not just here to provide for our family and protect them. Oh, those are important and we must do them. But beyond that, we are here to lead our families and to prepare them for what truly matters. And in that process, as we walk through the day to day, the challenge is for you and I to stay focused. It's so easily to give in to the temptation to just deal with how does this appear to people outside of the home instead of what's the reality inside the home. It's easy for us to cave in to just the demands of the immediate and put off the priority of, of the permanent. To, to just deal with the temporary and ignore the eternal. It's easy for us to, to pontificate at times at home and, and, and worry about their hearts and ignore our own. It's easy for us to worry about how what they do reflects on me instead of how what they do helps them and honors God. Well, it's a great challenge to lead our families today in a world where so much is coming at us constantly. This anti-God, deny God, defy God agenda is just coming at our, at our families from every direction as the world tries to squeeze us into their little mold so that we'll live and look just like them because they've got us to finally think like them and act like them and talk like them. Oh, 
what a challenge it is to lead our families today. But as great a challenge as that is, an even greater challenge is to lead our own hearts with all that's coming after us and we're being bombarded with, not just our kids. We need to guard our own hearts first and we need the Lord to lead us so that we're in a position to lead them. Well, today, as we conclude this series that we've called Headed Home, uh, I would like us to look at leading at home as men who ourselves are on the way home as followers of Jesus, uh, as we run the race marked out for us as his people. Uh, how can we lead at home in that process of heading home to the Father? Well, to do that, I'd like us to look at Job chapter 1. And so if you'll turn to Job chapter 1, uh, I'll just give you a couple reminders here. There are so many uh, misunderstandings and false impressions of the book of Job out there. So as we come to the book of Job, anytime you're in the book of Job, you need to remember a few things. First, the book of Job is more about God than it is about Job. Secondly, the book of Job is more about defining righteousness than about explaining suffering. Thirdly, the book of Job is more about trusting God's wisdom than making sense of God's justice. And finally, the way to handle suffering is not to merely imitate Job, it's to grow in our understanding of who God is. Now with all of that in mind, we're going to camp out this morning in the first few verses of Job chapter 1. And while our, our lives are not to be formed after him, he is here as a real man with real experiences from whom we can learn. And he is an example to us, and there are some things that we can learn from him. And I'd like us to consider these this morning. And so I want to challenge us this morning, men, with three things. And this will apply to all of us, but I'm particularly burdened for our, our men as husbands, as fathers, as grandfathers today. So the first thing I want us to look at, guys, is walk with God. Walk with God. Look at Job chapter 1, verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. Job is described in this incredible way that, that just makes us sit up and take note right away. I mean, what are you known for? How would those close to you describe you? Can you imagine being described this way? He was up, upright and blameless? Now, this blameless does not mean that he's sinless. It doesn't mean that he's perfect. It's speaking of his inner life, his relationship with God, his spiritual maturity, his integrity and purity of the inner man. Uh, upright speaks of then the other side, the, the external, the outer living that is seen and noticed by others, our interactions with others, um, the way we conduct ourselves, life lived in line with God's ways. And this is how Job is described. He is upright and blameless. He is a man of purity and integrity. This, this guy... You, you, you can't find any fault with this guy. He's a good guy. And you think, wow, what, where did this integrity come from? Where did this righteous living come from? Well, we're told here in this next phrase, it's because he feared God and turned from evil. Now in Job chapter 28, verse 28, uh, later on, God says, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to turn away from evil is understanding. To fear the Lord is wisdom, and to turn away from evil is understanding. Job was a pretty wise man. He was upright and blameless because he feared God, and he turned from evil. He did not ignore God and indulge in evil. He did not explain God and, uh, and excuse evil. He feared God, and he turned from evil. When we finally get a, a biblical, clear true, accurate picture of who God is, and we start to understand who the true and living God is and what he's all about, we live differently. We live lives of humility before him, uh, lives of worship to him, uh, lives that, that want to avoid sin and honor him in all things, lives that want to share in his holiness, as we saw in Hebrews chapter 12. We, we start to understand more and more that, that life is not about me. Life is about God. Senator John Ash, Ashcroft from the U.S. said, The most important thing his father ever taught him was that there were more important things than him. He said, The most important thing Dad ever taught me is that there's things more important in life than me. And that's one of the things we need to 
understand ourselves and communicate to our families. This isn't about us. This is about God. There is someone much more important than everything that we're all about and everything that we see going on around us. We need to teach our families who God is, not who people say he is, not who people want him to be, not who people kind of create and what do you think and what do you, what, what, what do you want to believe. The true and accurate revelation of who God is. We need to teach our families who God is and why this matters. That's Deuteronomy 6. Loving the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, putting, putting him before everything and teaching our children to do the same. That's Ephesians 6, bringing them up in the, in the discipline and the teaching of the Lord, that they will be instructed in what it means to, to have salvation in Jesus Christ, to be a, a child of God, to walk in holiness and what that means and why that is so important, and to live a life of worship. But brothers, it starts in your heart and it starts in mine. See, I can't lead others where I haven't been myself or where I'm not willing to go myself. And so we need to be committed to this process. If we're going to lead our families to walk with God, we ourselves must walk with him as we run this race marked out for us. Brothers, walk with God. Secondly, hold things loosely. Look at verse 3 of Job chapter 1. Job possessed 7,000 sheep. 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys, and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. I understand this is not what you are investing in, sheep and camels and oxen, <laughs> but in Job's day and in his part of the world, th these material possessions, this livestock, this, this is how you measured wealth. And what we're being told here is that Job was a wealthy man. I mean, he was loaded. He was the wealthiest guy around. He was a position, a person of position and influence as a result. But Job was a wealthy guy. And, and that's okay, but it's not the point. It certainly wasn't the point of his life. You see, Job loved God for who God is, not for what God gives. Job worshiped God for who God is, not for what God gives. Later in chapter 1, that will be the accusation that Satan brings. He'll come to God and say, Ha! That Job, he only loves you because of what you give him. Now, I'm happy to report that Satan was way off base on that. My question is, if he made that accusation about me or about you, would he be as far off base? Job loved God and worshipped God for who God is, not for what God gives. Look at the proof of this. Job chapter 1, verse 20, after he's lost it all. Then Job arose and tore his robe, and he shaved his head, and he fell on the ground, and he pounded his fists in the dirt, and he screamed, and he swore, and he said, Why me? Why this? Why God? Why, why, why? I had all of this. I deserve this. I, I've been such a good guy. Look at I'm blameless and upright. I fear you and turn from evil. You owe me. That, that's not what he said. Then Job arose and he tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb and naked shall I return. The Lord gave all four capital letters, Jehovah, Yahweh, the true and living God. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all of this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. Oh. Job felt the loss of all of the things that he owned. Of course he did. He felt intensely the loss of his children. We, we can only try to imagine what that was like. He felt that loss. He experienced and expressed that loss. But in it, he still worshipped God. He trusted God in the crisis and in the loss. He still clung to God and worshipped him. God hasn't changed. God's character has not changed. God's character does not come into question because things don't go my way. In that crisis and in that loss, he called out to God. He poured his heart out in his grief, but he also worshiped and said, Lord, this hurts, but you gave and you've taken away and blessed are you. You're still God. I will trust you. And in all of this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. Guys, you and I, we need to hold things loosely. 
we need to work hard and we need to teach our children to work hard as well so that they can pass a, uh, cash a paycheck with integrity. We need to work hard. We need to provide for our families and we need to thank God for his provision. But we need to understand that we must hold these things loosely. Ephesians 4 tells us that one of the reasons we work is not just to provide for the needs of our families, but so that we will have something to give to those in need. Not to say, why don't they go work like I did, but to say, I have more than I need. God has given me more than enough. Here, I'll share it with you in your moment of need. And, and if your whole life is centered around collecting things and gathering things up for yourself and having more and more and more and more, what happens when you lose it all? When the economy tanks? When there's a strike at work? When you lose your job? What happens then? What happens then? No. Job wasn't clinging to his stuff. Job said, I came into this world naked and empty-handed, and that's the way we go out. That's it. We can't take it with us. It's not about this. It's about so much more. Our, our stuff is not ours. Whatever we have, it is not ours. It is from God, and it is for God. This life is not about here and now. God does not owe us. We need to keep this in mind. God does not owe us. God did, Job rather, did not have everything he had in verse 3 because he was the kind of guy described in verse 1. Job didn't get all of this wealth because he was blameless and upright and, you know, feared God and, and shunned evil. That is not why he had what he had. God doesn't owe us. Well, I've done this for the Lord and I deserve... No, 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 no. That's not how this works. You and I, brothers, we need to hold things loosely. We need to love God and worship God for who he is, not merely for what he gives. And then we must teach our families to do the same. We love the God the same. We serve God the same. We worship God the same. Whether things are going super well or whether we're struggling. We love him every day when things are going smoothly and we love him in the midst of a crisis. It does not change because God does not change. Brothers, if we are going to walk well on our way home to the Father as we run this race marked out for us, and if we are going to lead our families to do the same as we lead them along, we must walk with God and we must hold things loosely. Third thing is this. We must pray for our kids. Pray for our kids. Look at verse 2. There were born to Job seven sons and three daughters. Seven sons and three daughters. That was one busy household. Look at verse 4. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day. And they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them. And he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my children have sinned and, and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. Pray for your kids. Job had a lot of kids, didn't he? Ten, seven sons, three daughters. And they were grown now. And on their birthdays, they would throw a feast. And it, it wouldn't just last for a day. It would last for a few days. And so each of, them, each of these sons would have a, his birthday. And he'd have a big party, a big feast. And he'd invite his brothers. And then they would send and invite. Before the party, they would send and invite their sisters to come and join as well. So you had all ten there gathered for this feast, this party. After, Job sent for all of them. And they would come and he would consecrate them. He'd pray for them. He'd sacrifice for them. See, back where, when Job lived long before the days of Moses, uh, the father was also the, the family priest. And here is this man, he's praying for his kids and he's sacrificing for his kids and he's just, he's just burdened for their heart before God. See, Job's greatest goal and hope for his children was not that they're happy and healthy. It was not that they're well-educated and financially secure. Job's greatest goal and hope was shown in his greatest fear for his kids. So let me ask you this. What's your greatest fear for your children? Is it sickness? Is it failing out of school? Is it financial loss and insecurity? Or is it their soul? What is your greatest fear? Because that tells us what our greatest treasure is, our greatest goal and hope for them. 
Job's greatest fear was their sin. Look at verse 5. He said, it might be that, that, that the children have sinned and, and cursed God in their hearts. They might have sinned externally or internally. They, th what, what might they might have done? He was afraid for them. And so he poured out his heart to God, praying for them and offering sacrifices on their behalf, saying, oh God, the, the hearts of my kids, that's what matters. That's what matters. Look at chapter 2, verse 9. As things continued to get worse for Job down the road, then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. See, Job was also tempted to curse God later. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish, ungodly women speak. Shall we receive good from the Lord and shall we not receive evil? Do you think God's just got to give us all sunshine and roses here? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. You and I have today what the saints of old looked for and longed for. They looked forward to it with anticipation and longing from a distance. We have the completed word of God. We have the Spirit of God indwelling us. We have the, the work of Jesus complete at the cross and the resurrection. Forgiveness and life in Him. We now stand in His righteousness. Oh, we have so much more than Job even had in terms of spiritual resources available to us, in terms of, of, of information for us to live our lives based on. Now, based on that, let me ask you, what do you pray for your kids? How do you pray for your kids? Is it about school and about a job and about a future spouse? Hey, that's good, and you should be praying for those things. But but those aren't even the place to start. Those come later. The place to start is, do you pray for their salvation? Are you pointing them to Christ? Anybody out there, the people at work, the people on your street, people that are actively working against God in this community want their kids to be healthy and have a good job and be happy. Anybody wants that. As a follower of Christ, on the way home, running the race marked out for you, as the adopted child of God, a citizen of his kingdom, should the burden of our heart not be, first and foremost, that our kids know Jesus, that they are saved, that they have the forgiveness and eternal life in and through him? Do you pray for the salvation of your children? Do you pray that they will walk with God as God's? That they will head home to the Father, guarding their hearts along the way, sharing in his holiness? We know, we know the challenges that they will face and that they are facing. We live in the same world and we've been in it longer. We know the challenges ahead. Pour out your heart for your kids that they would know Jesus and that they would then walk with him. That's where we need to be in our prayer for our kids. I need to pray for my influence on my children and for God's impact on my children on their hearts and lives, that it might bring glory to God. Do they know from you, directly from you, what matters most? Is that what you pray for for them? Is that what you talk to them about? Is that what you encourage them towards? What matters most? Do you talk to them about their purpose in life or just about their plans for life? I'm a planner. And there are times I can get sucked into that. Where I'm like, hey, what's next? What's next? What's next? Instead of, who are you supposed to be? Who are you supposed to be? Who are you supposed to be? Oh, what a difference. What a difference. Brothers, if we are going to walk well and grow and mature and as followers of Jesus on our way home, on the race marked out for us, as we're on our way home, if we're going to mature and if we're going to bring along and lead well those coming along behind us, we must walk with God, we must hold things loosely, and we must pray for our kids. Guys, we do not live for our children. We don't. We got to get over that. There's too many people today living for their kids. We don't live for our kids. And we don't live through our kids. Well, I wish I could have done this, so I want that. We don't live for them or through them. But we do live with them. And we do live before them as their example. So let's guard our hearts as we then guide theirs. Let's live so our hearts are ready. Let's lead so that their hearts are ready for the temptations of today, for the crisis of tomorrow, and for the reality of eternity. You and I have no guarantees of what's around the corner for us this afternoon or tomorrow. 
Let me just give us three, three more thoughts from this passage this morning. We have no guarantees what we'll face or what our children will choose. God owes us nothing and we have no guarantees. But we must live in such a way that we're faithful to God regardless and that we're putting our family in the best possible position to encounter Jesus and to follow Jesus. Secondly, we just need to look at, at Job 1 verses 1 to 5 and, and understand that this is the prologue to the book. This is the background. This is just telling us about who he is and what he's like. And the reason is so that when we get to verse 6 and we start to go through the rest of the book, that bells start going off and we start saying, hold it, why? Why is all the rest of this happening to him? I mean, of anybody, why then? Why this guy? He loves God. He fears God. He worships God. He walks with God. Why? Why would this happen to him? God owes no one. And there are spiritual realities going on around our lives that we are unaware of. What is going on in your life might not even be primarily about you. God might be doing something totally different. So our job is to simply be faithful and to cling to him. Finally, the point in it all is that my heart knows God and trusts God and worships God and is burdened to lead others to him. 3 John 4, John the Apostle writes to this church speaking about these believers that he's led to the Lord. And if he's thinking of them this way, how much more even do we think of that for our own children, in our own homes, in our grandchildren, in our own families? He says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. What makes you the happiest? Is it that they're successful in school? They earned another award. They're doing this. They're doing that. They got the promotion. Everything seems to be going well. They got a nice spouse. They got this. They got nice kids. Or is it that they're walking in the truth? Now, to those of us that are thinking today about our own fathers, and you're looking at me saying, Steve, this is so foreign. This makes no sense. This is, this is crazy. That's not my father. My father did not walk with God. My father lived for himself. My father did not hold things loosely. My father prized things above people and above all else. My father didn't live for eternity. He lived for here and now. Uh, pray for your kids. My father didn't even want to talk to us about anything important. Why would, why would he have prayed for us? No, that's not the reality of my life. Listen, we cannot change the past any more than we can control the future. And so if that has been your experience, let me simply say to you, first of all, I am sorry that that's how you've had to live and that's what you've come through. But let me encourage you with this. Look to and lean on your heavenly father. He can get you through this and over this and past this and beyond this. Look to him and lean on him and let him make you the dad he wants you to be instead of worrying about the dad that you had. Let him make you the father he wants you to be, guys. And anyone else out there who's struggling with, oh, why was my father like this? I had a terrible dad. I had this. Listen, there's a heavenly father who is perfect, who is loving, who is compassionate, who is gracious, and whose hand is extended to you through his son, Jesus. Embrace him. Come and follow him. Come and walk with him and let him meet the needs of your heart today. Well, as we close, I just want to say families, our wives, our children, our grandchildren, pray for us and work with us. We know we don't always get it right and we need help and we need encouragement and we need your prayer support. Pray with, for us and work with us as we run our race following Jesus and as we look to lead and guide you as you run yours as well. Well, let's pray. Father, we love you and first and foremost this morning, we wanna thank you that we can even call you Father because of what you've done for us in Jesus giving us forgiveness in life, adopting us into your family that we might stand in his righteousness and that we might be called your own. Thank you that we can call you Father. And thank you that we can trust your heart and that you are the Father of, of compassion and that you know what we can take. You remember that we are dust and, and you don't give us more than you are willing to help us walk through. And so Father, I pray that you would just help us to cling to you today. Help us to learn that. Father, the scariest thing we can see in our kids is ourselves. But the greatest thing we can see in our kids is Jesus. 
and the best thing we could see, they could see in us is Jesus. And so, Father, I pray that you would help us to work to that end, to teach our kids to, that it's all about walking with you and becoming like Christ. Help us to live that way, that they might know how to follow and what steps to take as they walk through their own lives. We thank you for our fathers. We pray for them today. Help us to be faithful in walking with you, in holding things loosely and not setting our roots too deep here and now, and in praying for our children. And Father, as we learn from Job, help us to worship you, his God, our God, the true and living God. Help us to lead well at home on our own journey home. Help us to guard our hearts and to guide theirs well. And help us to do it all for your glory and your purposes. How we commit ourselves to this, leaning on you for your strength along the way. In Jesus' name, amen.